Welcome to Donne Talks, provided to you by Donne Women in Music. I am your host, Gabriella Di Laccio, and in every episode I interview guests who are amplifying change. People who are using their voices and their positions to create bigger impact in our society. Our guest today is Rob Diemer. Rob is a composer, conductor, educator and author who advocates for living and underrepresented composers and explores the role that contemporary concert music plays in today's society. Part of what this whole thing is that I've been doing is to be able to encourage others to get into composition and the only way that they're going to do that, women and composers of, or people of color specifically, students and, and adults as well, uh, is for them to uh, hear voices yeah. from people like them and to normalize that so it's not a special thing. It shouldn't be um, uh, seen as like a special thing to put over in the corner. It's just like, no, there's no difference between a woman composer and a male composer and an LGBTQ composer and a composer of color now in the now what the third decade of the 21st century um, those those should all just be on the same level Robert currently holds the position of professor and head of composition in the School of Music at the State University of New York at Fredonia his work as an advocate for underrepresented composers led him to create the Composer Diversity Database and the Institute for Composer Diversity, which is dedicated to the celebration, education and advocacy of music created by composers from historically underrepresented groups through database resources and programming analysis. Welcome, Rob. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. We are going to talk, I think our aim, uh, the, the main subject we are going to talk today is diversity in music repertoire. But before we get into that, I really wanted to know a bit more about Rob, the composer, the musician, uh, the conductor. So tell us a little bit more about your journey. How did you start your journey into becoming a musician? It, it has not been a straight line uh, or a straight path, yeah. so to speak. Uh, is, I'll, is it? I'll give you the, the condensed version. Um, basically, I, I fell in love with music at a very early age, uh, discovered uh, at least arranging, not composing, but I started arranging um, jazz ensemble uh, music when I was in high school. Uh, studied music education. I thought I was going to be a high school band director in suburban Chicago uh, when I was doing my undergrad, but um, through through a number of, of happy accidents, kind of discovered the idea of being a composer was something that I was not only interested in, but but I guess good at. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, it, I had no training. So uh, the idea of, uh, at that point, being a composer, the only thing I wanted to do at that point was to be a film composer. So I went out to Los Angeles and studied film scoring at the University of Southern California, uh, lived in L.A. for three years, figured out that, A, I, did not, I wasn't so interested in being a freelance composer, uh, and B, I should probably actually learn what I was doing because at that point I was still completely self-taught and it was in my late twenties. So I went back, I did my graduate studies, uh, in, um, in composing and conducting cause I wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to be a composer who conducted or vice versa, decided that being a composer who conducted was, was better for me. Uh, so yeah, I, I went to the university of Texas for my doctorate and, uh, Found myself in Oklahoma uh, for a couple of years uh, teaching, you know, year to year and started a radio show uh, there, which led me to get to know a lot of composers around the country because I was featuring living composers. I love the idea of advocating for living composers even back then. This was 15 years ago. Uh, and then got the job here in Western New, new York, uh, uh, State University of New York at Fredonia. When was that? The- oh, that was in 2007. So okay. I just finished my 13th year. And uh, over time, I got a chance to, uh, you know, compose for a lot of uh, amazing musicians and, and ensembles. But I also got a chance to write 
for New Music Box and the New York Times and, and uh, you know, the idea of uh, not only writing music and not only teaching, but also using a large platform to be, to be able to advocate and to convince folks to do good things. Uh, has been something that's been on my plate for a while. And, uh, you know, then, then the last few years, uh, I, I kind of, again, another happy accident, uh, turned a small project into the Institute. Yes. So the Institute, and before we go into the Institute, I want to kind of go back like what, four years, five years. Yeah. I think there was something in the water five, six years ago, because that was the time when I had my vision of my ignorance, <laughs> I like to call it, uh, for me was kind of 2014 and, and then 15. And I remember, as I told you, that finding your Google Sheets of the composers and then you were still kind of, I remember just seeing those messages and I, lo I looked at this list as well, like combined with the other 6,000 that I had found uh, in the encyclopedia. I was like, oh my God, what's this? And then I remember your development and then it became when it became the composer diversity and then so tell us first of all i want to know and i'm sorry you are a white male guy which is the stereotype and you are also a composer for me you starting a project that promotes composers is like me starting a project that promotes other sopranos and then you know <laughs> which nothing wrong with that guys by the way but you know as i always felt like uh, singers had as as women singers had more opportunity than instrumentalists and composers and for me the the calling was really with the women in history and women composers but you are a composer and then you decide to okay, guys, I'm going to create a way for you to find out all the competition that is out there, all these amazing people who are out there. So tell us about, first, what inspired you to do that? Well, it's a good question. And it's something that, that a lot of folks have, have uh, been curious about because it really seems kind of, why would, why would you be doing this if you yourself are, are a composer? I think a lot of it actually has to do with, um, with what I, I, I just mentioned a little bit earlier in terms of, of my history. Most composers, most composers, uh, tend to discover composing when they are, say, somewhere between 10 and 20. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of young composers over time. And uh, by the time you get, say, out of undergraduate uh, studies, uh, you're already, you think of yourself as a composer. You've been composing for years, all of these things. I started studying composition when I was 27 uh, on, a, on a, you know, kind, kind of a, um, an official basis, so to speak. And so I think looking back at that, I have a different view of myself as a composer and, uh, and looking back at it, I really wish someone had come to me and say, Hey, you're really good at this. You should do this. You have a lot of potential. Why don't you try that? Nobody ever did that in my particular case. Cause I was living in, in Northern Illinois out in the cornfields, uh, so to speak. And, you know, the idea of being a composer was not really something that people really thought of as something that you could do unless you just happened to, um, you happen to just start composing when you were 10, like, like Mozart, so to speak. So I think that that's something that I've always taken with me. The idea that even though, I, yes, I am a composer, I want to help others discover it. And not only uh, for, for audience members and listeners to, to discover new composers, but also to, to convince, uh, you know, especially young folks, uh, that composing is something that they could do. So that's always been something that, that's been interesting to me. Um, hence my, my radio show on living composers and all of that. But then over time, I, you know, after doing research and after getting to know a lot of composers and a lot of women composers, cause that's kind of how this whole thing started. Um, you know, I discovered that, that as hard as it is for anyone to get started as a composer, it's extremely hard for women and, and people of color to 
at least it was, you know, it has been up until this point, very difficult to uh, convince teachers that that was something that they could do, but then also convince the students or the composers themselves that that was something that was, was um, yeah. Yeah. An, an opportunity that's available for them. And so that's kind of how this whole thing got started. I don't really see it as like a competition thing because basically all of my opportunities that I've had to compose, I just see as like, that's gravy for me. I'm, I've been totally lucky to be able to have the opportunities that I have. And now that I've been doing it long enough, um, I really feel a responsibility to kind of give back to the community as, as best I can. And I think I think something we were talking to um, Anna yesterday as well, which is this um, notion that we have, at least at the beginning of our careers, that people tell us that, oh, it's very hard, it's very hard, there's no space for everybody, uh, you, uh, it's very difficult to make it, and uh, you, you have competition, competition, competition. And I think finally, it took me so many years to understand that I don't really see people as competition anymore because you know we have so many different voices as artists and i know i i will never please everybody uh and i but i know there are lots of people who really enjoy my voice uh in terms of artistic voice mm -hmm. uh and i think we we have to believe that there is space and opportunity for many more people that we were told i think in our um at the beginning of our careers at least i was told it was such a, it, I'm not saying it's an easy career. Of course, it's hard. Of course, sure. it's hard. But we shouldn't see other successful people as, um, you know, a threat. So uh, in, in a way, I, I totally understand because I think promoting other people is, is amazing. And I think encouraging other people to to go through the journey as a singer as well. I think I I have so much. I totally understand. I have a lot of pleasure to give any advice, I mean, advice, such a great word, but uh, any share experiences, you know, of how we did it or because if you have it inside of you as an artist, it's so fulfilling and yeah. there's no way you don't want to share that. Well, and also I think from, from my own vantage point, I've grown to have a slightly different concept of, of what it means to be a composer uh, than maybe it was 40 or 50 years ago, where it seemed like if you were a composer, you were only a well-known composer if the community at large uh, said so right like like there were the vaunt the, uh, the 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 lucky few who um whoever was in charge of of saying this is the important composer and that's the important composer those are the folks who you get to listen to it was a white male wasn't it right of course yeah yeah <laughs> 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 and, and I think over time, you know, I've, I've really grown, especially working with music educators here in the States. I think it's, it's come to the point where, where the idea of composing is not something that is only for the lucky few. It is something that literally everybody can do. And, and it's something that I always tell my students when I, when I am introduced to, to the first year students at Fredonia that, you know, I tell them, it's like, how many of, how many, I ask them, how many of you have written poetry before? And most of them have. And I'm like, it's exactly the same thing. You're just using a different language. But that idea of, of saying, no, oh, I couldn't compose because I can't compose anything as good as, you know, this composer, that composer. And I'm like, that's silly. You know, it, it, it's absolutely, I understand why people say that. And there's a lot of people who actually push that idea because they want to keep the, the field small. Uh, but really that's, I mean, that's part of what this whole thing is that I've been doing is to be able to encourage others to get into composition and the only way that they're going to do that women and composers of, or and people of color specifically students and and adults as well uh is for them to uh hear voices yeah. from people like them yeah. and to normalize that so it's not a special thing but it's just oh this is just a normal 
you know, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be seen as like a special thing to put over in the corner. It's just like, no, there's no difference between a woman composer and a male composer and an LGBTQ composer and a composer of color now in the now what the third decade of the 20th century or 21st century um those those should all just be on the same level and that's kind of what i've yeah. what i've been doing the last few years it's to try and it should, shouldn't it? we're going to talk about the the should in a minute but let's talk about then you created the composer diversity if you go to this website and you have no idea of the all the details that you can actually tailor this database to search for a piece of music is actually, I can't imagine the amount of work uh, you guys had to put into hours to kind of, uh, so really people don't have excuses. If they don't have excuses to not play music by women when they come to Donna's website, if you go to your website, then the, the game is kind of, whew, Okay, we raised it, Gabriella. Your project, we raised it to a completely <laughs> level here. Uh, so you did all that, and then, of course, now you have the institute. And what what's the difference? Just uh, it's bigger, better. What is the vision for the future? It's yeah. Thank you. It's uh, so so as you mentioned, uh, this whole thing started out just as a spreadsheet uh, that that I came um, up with. Uh, start, started initially just with women composers back in 2016 and basically for about two years, uh, just did that. And, and I put it out on Facebook, put it out on Twitter and just said, Hey, this seemed th it was a project that I had started for my students, uh, here at Fredonia because thinking, uh, um, a resource would be useful, uh, for them to be able to, and, and literally I just had like, um, uh, names and hyperlinks to their websites. That was it because I thought, well, that's, that's a start. Uh, but as I started working with this list of 200 and then 600, and then it just kept going and going, it figured a, uh, this should be a resource that everybody should use, not just my students. Uh, but also it wasn't very useful if it was just a list of names, because then you're just expecting people to just hopefully come across uh, especially if they're looking for a specific kind of music or a piece of music, uh, just sending people to a bunch of different websites doesn't help very much. So I came up with the idea of, of allowing folks to search and browse by different uh, categories. So whether or not they're living or dead, whether or not they live in, you know, what city, what country, state, or city they live in, what, what are the different you're genres. You're crazy, right? You know that. <laughs> Say that again? We're a bit crazy, right? You know that. It, it, it was crazy. And it was it was just kind of one of those things where I'm like, oh, well, this is what I need to do. Therefore, I just, I had no idea the hours and hours and months and years that I would be putting into this. But that idea of, of being able to search by genre and also by, uh, by demographics, whether or not they were, you know, racial, ethnic, or, or cultural heritages. Uh, and initially, it was just women. But once I kind of publicly launched the Google uh, spreadsheet officially, called it the Women Composers Database, I'm like, well, if I'm going to do that, it it's not that hard to then just add all of the male composers of color because I already had all the female composers of color in there already. So then it became the Composer Diversity Database. That launched in the summer of, of 2018. And it was... It was interesting because a, a colleague of mine uh, said, hey, you're probably, you know, this is a big enough project. You're going to need some help. And I had had already had people helping me. But the idea of they were, I thought they were just kind of friends helping. Uh, the idea of actually creating an organization to do this didn't really start until after we launched the website. Mm -hmm. um, once I started the Institute, that allowed for me to a, expand the database so it wasn't just a database where you could search composers but you could also look up works and then also it allowed for me to to do something else that i was really interested in which was to analyze what orchestras and and now we're also going to be doing analysis on wind bands here in the states and hopefully other ensembles as well uh looking looking at programming and 
kind of trying to convince folks, hey, this is actually the state of the union. This is this is what the state of our community is, how, what people are doing. And then to try to kind of convince them, hey, you could do it differently. Oh, and oh, by the way, we have these resources that you could use to do that differently. So that's kind of uh, that I, I tend to think of the three prongs of what we're doing with the Institute is we do the advocacy, we do the analysis in order to be able to do the advocacy, and then we have the resources by which we convince folks to, um, you know, put that advocacy into place. And, and do you manage to convince them? Uh, I think so. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who have been using it uh, since we launched the, uh, the composerdiversity.com website as the Institute uh, in yeah. January of uh, two th uh, 2019. So it's been almost a, a year and a half. We've had over 60,000 visitors to it. Uh, and... I've heard a lot of people say that they have used our site for many different, you know, we've, we've had, uh, you know, conductors use it for their programming. We've had uh, educators use it in their classroom. Um, we've had radio show folks uh, yeah. use it to find, uh, you know, music for, for their radio. So it's, it's fun to be able to know that it is, it's doing what I hoped it would be doing. And now it's a matter of how to make it even better. That's really amazing. Is there any kind of, well, I'm sure the answer is yes, but what kind of challenges you have? Because it's such a wide vision, diversity. For me, it was easier because I am a woman and I wanted to support women. Sure. Uh, but of course, at the same time, um, my eyes are very open for for diversity. I just can't uh, embrace everything in the project, so I decided to keep uh, focused on women. What are the biggest uh, challenges you find for having such a wide vision to support diversity? Because it never ends, I guess. No, uh, I'm sure for you. I, yeah, I, there there are obviously there there are a lot of challenges. Uh, you know, you run into uh, a lot of folks on one side who don't see the need because they're happy to perform uh, all of the, the the old dead white guys, uh, you know, because sure. that's what they grew up with. That's what their teachers grew up with. Uh, you know, so so that's a challenge. How do how do you slowly move the needle on that end? Uh, and then you have folks on the other side who are really uh, you know, they are, they are so, uh, energetic and passionate about this. It is a challenge, uh, being a white guy, uh, <laughs> because I mean, and, and it's a challenge that I totally take on. And it's, it's one of those things where I totally understand there's, there's, there have been questions in terms of whether or not is it appropriate for someone like me to be able to do all of this. Um, and all I've been able to say is that I'm willing to put the time and effort into it. I do have a lot of experience with administrative and, and things in terms of uh, both structuring or an organization, as well as understanding how teachers think, how conductors think, how composers think, and trying to come up with the resources in a way uh, that it's not... Um, it, it's not doing things badly. Like it's, you're, you're not trying to help. And in by trying to help, you're actually making things worse. You know, I'm trying to allow for folks to be able to discover on their own rather than me going, Hey, this is what you need to be doing. And these are the composers that you need to be uh, performing because, you know, I should not be a gatekeeper in, in that uh, um, realm. So the the biggest challenge uh, from what you were alluding to is, you know, I started out uh, as as well as as you did, uh, thinking of it just as a women composers um, thing because that's kind of how I got this whole project started, uh, helping to support uh, the women who were in my studio. But over time, it just felt right to expand the concept of a searchable database to include uh, composers of color. And now recently we've also included LGBTQIA composers 
as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so the challenge with that is with, with that particular thing of having kind of, I describe it as a big tent, um, you know, a very wide and broad organization rather than one that focuses deep on one, uh, component of underrepresented composers is that, yeah, you, you, they're not all the same, right? There are a lot more women composers than there are composers of color and LGBTQIA composers, they have had difficulties for different reasons, but there are some composers, namely uh, white gay composers, especially in the 20th century, uh, who did not let, we can just uh, be blunt and say, they don't need help, right? And so how do you create resources where, uh, say, you know, we have uh, the ability to be able to search for LGBTQ composers, but I would not advocate for folks to use that particular tool in the same way that I would for them to be able to use the tool to search for, say, composers of color, because there are a lot less composers of color out in the repertoire than there are LGBTQ or, say, specifically white gay composers. And so when you're dealing with all of these things, I mean, there's, I, I have stepped in it more times than I can count. I've, you know, trying to be helpful and I'll say something. And then, you know, suddenly um, online people are like, what are you talking about? That's the worst thing in the world. And and I'm like, okay, okay, I'm sorry. You know, I'll back up and be like, okay, let's try a different tack. And slowly over time, just, just uh, by, by making a lot of mistakes in, in the public eye, I've, I've slowly been able to kind of make it such that hopefully the resources are useful and hopefully folks also understand that I'm trying to do right by them. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, I think it's great that you are a white male doing this. I, I think you should just not feel bad at all. It's, it's exactly, it's, it's amazing. We, we need people like you because for me, so I'm, a more, I'm a woman, I'm defending women and, uh, and normally people will support their the minority that they are part of and that's sure. very strong as it should be i think there's a lot of strength that for somebody like you to to be in this position because you're such a, a great example like so many other people uh should be following the database is, is such a fantastic tool as you said and and, and i agree with you many people probably don't want to use it and uh and those people, uh, I think I learned, we, we shouldn't waste much energy trying to convince them because they're not going to change their minds, sadly. And we have sure. to put our energy into convincing the ones who are opened. And there are lots of people who are uh, open to, to change slowly or, or to at least acknowledge they don't know enough to be programming things and that they can slowly... Uh, change their minds and it, it never ends in my opinion for me it never ends we did we did two years the the orchestral research only for this uh, global 15 top orchestras for a gramophone research and uh, on that note I didn't see a lot of change but of course I, I looked more globally and those are super big names and like I couldn't really go there and say hello guys did you did you see that are you willing to improve and and right. those institutions it seems to me they care less because they have such a huge following but funnily enough they are the ones with the biggest power to actually educate people in a nice way by including different pieces in in concerts well i will say that one of the uh, uh, the main advantages that that or the um yeah i'll call it an advantage is that that i have been able to do this is that it's not just me you know i started the spreadsheets way back in 2016 but it took a little while for for folks to to get connected with it but over the last few years i would say most of the stuff that that we most of the resources that we currently have on the database um, has been put there by, uh, volunteers and folks who have just been out in the world help helping us. They come to us, uh, they come to me and say, Hey, I'm really interested in this. Can I help? 
and they will spend hours doing this. Uh, you know, for example, many of the uh, the works in our works database was put there by still a young uh, educator. He's currently doing his his graduate studies at the University of South Carolina, Christian Michael Folk, and he put in thousands of works by he came up with his own database of works for wind band and then for orchestra. And then we've been, we've been able to integrate that. Um, but even just recently, like we've had folks, uh, I'm seeing Denise Rivera is, is currently, um, uh, uh, watching us and, uh, she's a really good friend and an advocate, uh, for the composers of Puerto Rico. And, uh, and came to me and said, Hey, is there a way to be able to allow for us to be able to find composers from this, uh, this, uh, U.S. territory, Puerto Rico, uh, in the Caribbean, and uh, I was like, "That's a good question. Let's see if we can figure it out." And we did. We we uh, she was able to to show me composers that I was unaware of, uh, and we were able to fix the the interface. Uh, it made it such so that you could search for those composers in in the railway. So, I mean, and that's just you know two examples. I have. A litany of of folks, uh, a large list of of uh, volunteers and and advocates who see this as really important. And then for me to just kind of look at all of it and go, okay, well, how are we going to make this work? Uh, and then slowly over time, we're able to do that. So I want to make sure this isn't just me. If anything, I'm I'm just kind of trying to steer the the ship at this point. There's a lot of folks who've been working on this for a long time. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, and I'm sure all the people involved, they, it gives you a lot of pleasure, I guess, to be involved in a project like this. I mean, if you are enjoying this podcast, there are three simple things you can do to support our work. First, subscribe. This way you will never miss an episode. Second, tell about us to a friend or family member. You will always have someone to share the stories of this interview, and this way we can raise awareness and inspire more people in our way. Third, give us a review on iTunes or whatever other channel you subscribe. This way you will be helping others to find our podcast. Now, let's get back to my conversation with Rob Dima. Going through this pandemic, and of course our reality as musicians, as concert goers, uh, has completely changed. Uh, the, the music world has changed and we still don't know exactly how the future will be for all of us. Do you think this pandemic will affect, uh, because I think we had such a, a, a small revolution going on for the past two years, you know, so many nice, wonderful initiatives uh have appeared as well in the past years is not only yours or mine uh, I, I i i refuse to name it because i know i will forget so many but on donny's sure. website we list all the ones that are appearing so people can because each one of them is focused in something different and more like concert series or so please please keep checking guys but i think we had a a, a nice uh push and then suddenly the pandemic is happening and now theaters are really worried about what we're going to do. Are we going to just fill a couple of seats? So do you think this war, this small uh, conscience of diversity and, and inclu inclusion in programs is going to disappear? Or I don't know, uh, how can we make sure it doesn't? You know, the, the, the nice movement that started doesn't go away. It is, it is one of the big questions, uh, that I've been, uh, wrestling with over the last three months, all of these different, it's how does one advocate for repertoire diversity and to change folks is, uh, you know, musicians mindsets in terms of the music that they're choosing when everyone is so focused on whether or not are they going to have a season? Are they going to have a job? Are they, go you know, all of those kind of bread and butter, nuts and bolts issues that people are worried about survival and, and making sure that they can pay their mortgage. <clears throat> how, how does one make sure to, um, to think about that? Um, a couple things makes me think that, uh, 
I think it is a good time for that. A, at least from my own uh, vantage point, we've seen a doubling of um, folks of of traffic on our website over the last since since March. Uh, it was average. You know, we had kind of more or less an average of maybe twenty five hundred visitors a month, uh, and in March and in April and in May, it's been about 5,000 or over that per month, which basically shows me there's a lot of folks who, for whatever reason, they're interested in at least uh, looking at our resources and and trying to discover composers and, and repertoire. Um, so it makes me think that people may see this as as an opportunity for them to at least have some time to explore music that they might not normally have if they're super busy going to work and doing all of the things that they have to do normally. If everybody is kind of forced to be staying at home, they have a little bit more time, they're online, they can they can do this. So I'm hoping that that uh, um, bodes well for the future. But at the same time, I think one of the other really important aspects to this, and it's one of the things that I've really been pushing for our our institute's mission is that even though it seems from the outside that uh our focus is to support these underrepresented composers which it absolutely is the primary goal of what we're doing here is to uh connect that music to the audiences to the students um, to the people who are going to be listening to and performing that music. And hopefully, let's say it's easy to focus on, or focus on orchestras because uh, it, you know, they're very public and, and there's a lot of them. Um, but this kind of goes for all musical, you know, whether or not it's chamber music or, or, or all, all stripes of the musical community. Um, the more you can diversify your repertoire that can also help you to diversify your audience and hopefully to actually bring more audience in. So once we're able to get back to the point where we can put butts in seats again, uh, in theaters, uh, hopefully there will be a great new, you know, uh, there will be new audiences that will be interested in coming to these, uh, concerts. So, I mean, that's, that's really, we can't control, uh, what mother nature is, uh, is, has been throwing at us. We, we can, we can mitigate it. Um, but that will take time, but we can use the time that we have to not only figure out how to be able to, to keep ourselves afloat financially, but also to be able to do what we're doing in a better way. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm a very positive person normally, and I, I I do see as a great opportunity, a great opportunity for people out there to. There's so many resources they can now listen to music by women or diverse composers online. Uh, they can go on your website and find YouTube videos and you know spend some time uh, seeing what they like the most, and then hopefully when all this is over. Uh, there will be an openness in their view as an audience as well. And for for us performers as well, uh, I have a lot of uh, music by women in my repertoire, but it's been great to have more time to explore even more. Because for me, I, I have this, I'm so lucky. I'm in contact with all these amazing women. And I just wish I had a parallel life to learn <laughs> A lot of more music, you know, because it's uh, the it's so many great repertoire available for us singers and for us musicians. So, as a musician myself, I I would just tell everybody out there, keep exploring because it's a uh, it's so many musicians, even colleagues who have no prejudice, but we 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 come with our unconscious bias as as people, you know, and myself. I grew up going to concerts, never questioning. So if it happened to me, I know it happens to many of my colleagues who are being taught to, oh, you're playing cello, you have to play, this is the repertoire, this is the piano repertoire. And then we kind of don't explore other avenues. So I see this moment as a great opportunity for 
uh, own development as uh, more uh, diverse artists in, in, in the repertoire we choose. Uh, so I hope we can go for the positive as well, but it is worrying. It is worrying. Okay, uh, I need to open for questions, but before I do that, did I uh, not ask you something that you would like to talk about? Um, no, I don't think so. I think the only the only thing I would mention is um, uh, that you know because chamber music, for example, is one of you know the things that I think we will be able to do in the in the foreseeable future. Um, it's good that our, currently our works databases include music by wind band, orchestra, and art song uh, because of the folks who were uh, who put these things together. The Cassia Art Song Database um, mm -hmm. by Logan Contreras was another one uh, that she had put all of these art songs together and we put them into our database to be able to allow folks to do it. We are currently building a chamber music database um, that's similar to 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 those where you can search uh, works by duration, by instrumentation, all of these things. And hopefully, once that goes online, and it will take a little while because, you can, as you can imagine, there's probably twenty or thirty thousand works we're going to have to put in that. Uh, so it'll take a little while for us to to build that. But once that's there, I think that will kind of exponentially grow the. The, the usefulness of our resources because uh, right now it's great for conductors to be able to use it, but for all musicians to be able to use it, uh, irrespective of level, you know, you know let's say yeah. difficulty level and all of those things. Um, hopefully in the next, let's say two years, we'll be able to make it to the point where everybody can use it. That's amazing. Okay. Let's see. Um, Based on your experience, which minority group is currently the least represented in classical music? Ooh, tough. <laughs> we well, there are a lot of groups. <laughs> um, I think, let's see. It tends to to be, I think, and it's 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 so hard, but I think if, if we're gonna make a generality. Uh, I would say that, uh, especially in the last, say, two years, there have there has been a slow increase for both composers of color and for women composers. Uh, I would say, in general, composers of color, just because of the lack of numbers, there are just less, uh, say, black composers or Latinx composers um, that that are out there. There are a lot of Asian composers, so I think they're less of an that that particular demographic is less of an issue because composing is something that's very uh, um, you find a lot of Chinese composers and Korean and, and Japanese and so on and so forth. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, and this isn't just in the United States, this is I think it's it's just you can look at the numbers and say there are less black composers and less uh, Latin American or Latinx composers. Um, and so I would say those are probably uh, the groups that need the most help. Uh, and yeah. in terms of uh, making sure that people know who they are, they have a lot of really good music. There's a lot of good music in those communities of composers. And now it's just a matter of making sure that people know who they are, know what the music is, and then, it, you know, encouraging folks to be able to perform it. I think that question is related, which is which areas, what areas of the database you think you need expanding the most, which is the one you just mentioned, I guess, no? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of of expanding it, it's really it's it's what we're trying to do now is kind of both vertical and horizontal. Uh, we we want to bring in as many new composers as we can, and we're learning more about them every day. Uh, mm -hmm. We have submissions that folks send their stuff to us and then we'll put it into the database. But also I'm always like either on Twitter or Facebook and someone mentions a new composer, I'm like, oh, put that on the list and then uh, find their information and put it in. But also now at this point, in terms of information, it's primarily 
finding the actual works and getting the works into the database because it's one thing to look for a composer but then you still have to go through their website yeah but to be able to find their music but if you're let's say if you're looking for a work for soprano and you know let's say an art song to be able to go to the database and just say i need a uh I, i'm looking for an art song by a com uh, let's say a living woman composer of color click yeah. click click oh and by the way yeah. it can't be longer than x yeah. yeah, and it can't be longer than 10 minutes long because, you know, of, of the limitations. And so you can do all of those things, and then, boom, there's there are a number of works that you can then uh, listen to, hopefully, uh, maybe find videos of them, hopefully, p potentially even see a PDF of the score. And it's that kind of enriching of the the uh, the information that we already have in addition to expanding it that that we're focused on. That's amazing. Uh, another one from Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Does the database include Aboriginal Australian composers as a searchable area? <laughs> and that's probably your life, isn't it? There's so many subcategories in diversity that you have to. That's why I am a great admirer of your work. <laughs> well, and I th it's it's a perfect uh question because it is that has been on the list of okay one of the things we need to do is to we currently have a category in the in the in the demographics for um uh, american indian slash uh alaskan native but we do not have um a category for say oceana uh or indigenous composers from uh, from Canada. And so these are the, t these are the types of things where, uh, I, I literally just, uh, was looking at one of our lists a couple days ago and discovered a Maori, uh, composer where I'm like, okay, yep, we need to get that in there because, uh, you know, she doesn't fit any of these, any of these categories. So that has been on the list of, uh, we need to add that to our, our demographics list. And then it, also would then encourage us to kind of specifically dig for other composers who belong to those groups that and group. uh, uh, to be able to to find even new voices that we don't know about. So Hannah, if you, yeah, there, there are submission forms on our site. If you do know of any composers uh, or if you're a composer yourself who belongs to those groups, please just submit uh, your information as a composer and then also for the works, and we'll be happy to add them. And it's exactly as a Hidenese submit entries. I think uh, for people watching this video, even if you didn't watch live, and if you know composers, please tell them to go to, if you are a woman, also submit your entry to Donne, of course, but go to Rob's, uh, to the Compo Institute for Composer Diversity. I will put the website back in a minute and submit your entry because I think that's the easiest way for the list to grow organically as well. Um, instead of we keeping we keeping searching, of course. I'm, I'm exactly like you. Every time I see a new, oh, probably on your feed. <laughs> Who's this composer? Um, and uh, oh, another one uh, from Hannah. Can I just, before, Hannah, can you hold one second? I have a question from Eric. Eric is our uh, research editor for the daily blog. Hi, Eric. I can't pronounce his surname. Rizjanars? I can never do it. Um, and he has a great passion for women. He has sent two questions by email. So, first question. How to convince men? I think he means how to convince men in charge in you know in positions men who are in the position of making decisions uh how do you convince the men in power to go for the inclusion of this new repertoire because it's part of my my last question as well but <laughs> you are a man <laughs> 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 how do how do you how do you convince them i think it's a combination of in my experience it's you, you it's not just one way like one of the things that we've been doing with our analysis is to uh look at 
we we've analyzed 120 orchestras around the country in here in the states and then i just put up the numbers uh of all of them not to aggregate them but to actually put them you know side by side and that kind of competition of like oh wait we're not nearly we're not doing as well as we could that in and of itself kind of uh kind of pushes people a little bit to be like wait a minute we should we're we don't look as good as we thought we did maybe we should do things differently um i know yeah. for instance um the philadelphia orchestra a couple of years ago had zero women composers on their season and they caught hell for it in the press there were a lot of articles both online and in their newspapers decrying the fact that that they had you know, put together this large season and it didn't have a single woman composer on it. Uh, they somehow figured out a way to change their program. So they were able to get at least a couple of women composers. But then the following year, just this year, 1920, uh, they added a large number of composers. So they, that kind of changed their mind. Oh, wait a minute. This might be something we need to do. It's my hope that, uh, that then becomes consistent rather than just a blip. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm going to show, um, Hannah's question, which, which mm -hmm. I think relates, which is, aren't you concerned that, that this might lead to higher rates of tokenism in concert programming? It's a great question, uh, and it's something that comes up all the time because, unfortunately, uh, a lot of musicians and, and ensembles specifically, not just individuals, but ensembles, they tend to program thematically. So it's very easy for them, for if you go, say, to an orchestra concert, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, see, here is a concert of French composers or here's a concert of russian composers and the problem with this is is that they do the same thing for say women composers or, or composers of color so they will then decide okay we're going to put all the women composers on one concert which is bad on a number of reasons uh for for a lot of reasons a uh women composers hate that you know uh, and also, you're limiting the, the number of, of works that you're going to perform uh, by women composers to just the works on that particular concert. Uh, and also, it really, by, by focusing the, 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 the spotlight on those composers in that kind of pinpoint uh, uh, technique, it, 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 it kind of says, okay, this is a special group and now we're going to go back to the normal group of composers. And what we've really been trying to advocate for is to not do that, to really get compo get orchestras and other groups to not um, program in that way. But rather, if you want to focus, if you want to feature women composers, put one on every concert or put at least enough across your season spread out evenly that let's say if people want to hear works by women composers, they don't have to just go to, to a concert in February or sorry, in March, oh. and then they'll get that right. It's so yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's something that slowly over time, I think conductors and, and orchestras and music organizations are figuring out. They thought they were doing the right thing, but they're actually making it worse. Uh, and so hopefully we can see that changed over time. Well, um, I think just to compliment, I don't know. I, I think s s many women don't like being called women composers or being put in a concert of only women composers. But from my experience, some of them enjoy that because I think it's a, it's a great force of uh especially what uh, the the response i have from audiences sometimes is the surprise like oh i didn't know there was so much good music by women that you can actually right. do one concert and you go you can do made it thousands of concerts <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> like, it's a good strategy just to kind of showcase hello and i um just if you allow me to comment on hannah's a question I don't think uh, if people will think is tokenism, if people will think is is just quota, people will think that. But 
that's not the case here. This is if equality existed, we wouldn't need these projects. We wouldn't need my project or your project. The world would be equal. But equality doesn't is not there. So we need to push. I find the need to push. So I still find the need to do a concert with more women than men. And uh, yesterday I was the, the, the talking about with colleagues about the future program. And I was really pushing guys, not enough women in this program, not enough women in this program, <laughs> right. you know, and, uh, and it's not for tokenism because, like, because there are amazing pieces of work that you can, uh, we can include every time. I think my goal will be at least, as you said, one piece, not like a five minutes piece, but a, a right. substantial piece in each concert. If you're doing Beethoven's fifth, for God's sake, the audience will come for that. Just add something else, you know, right. a good length piece by a woman or by a, a diverse uh, composer to, to be part of that program. And I think I will never see that tokenism. I will always see like a great opportunity for educating people ourselves as well. I, I learn new repertoire uh, every week, every day, <laughs> just with our daily blog, those two new composers we promote every day. I always go there and I listen to their music and I go, wow, wow. So I, I think we shouldn't and I, be. And I would also say that I love the idea of having an entire concert of women composers in the same way that you have an entire concert of male composers. Yeah. Just don't make a big deal of the fact that you're doing an entire, like, don't, don't say here's a special concert. Just be like, and here's and a concert. concert. Yeah. It's and true. we're not going to make a big deal of the gender of the composers. Uh, you know, and so, so it's that normalization of it. So it's, it's not even, uh, the fact, the, the idea of a, you need to spread it out. So it's throughout the season. But if one of those concerts happens to be all women composers, great. Just don't make a big deal. Like don't point to it and say, look, aren't we doing a good job? You're just like, no, that's, that should yeah. just be yeah. a, a Thursday. That shouldn't yeah. be, uh, something to, to, to make a big deal of. Other than the fact that that you just you put it out there, and over time people will expect to see it, and it will look weird if you don't have it. Yeah. Um, can you measure how often your database is accessed by people from different geographical regions? Question from Mary. Mary. Uh, yes, we do have. Uh, I haven't looked at it recently, but I know that that uh, you know looking at the analytics or the site uh, that we do have folks around the world using it, which is exciting, uh, especially for me, you know, because this room here is basically uh, where I've been working on this project now for the last four years. And the idea of here, here, here I am sitting in, you know, in Western New York, Lake Erie is just outside my house. And uh, to put all of this stuff together to then have folks, literally across the globe, uh, using it is, is very satisfying. And, and, uh, hopefully we can, we can get more. Uh, one of the things I also wanted to, to, to kind of, I'm going to copy what, what Gabby was doing was, was to look at more, you know, try to analyze what orchestras are doing outside of the States. Currently we're, we're doing it pretty much in the States, but over time I want to see What's going on in England? What's going on in the in the EU? What's going on in Australia and yeah. elsewhere? And see what right. what are the different you know what are the differences in programming from location to location? Yeah, you'd be surprised. Uh, <laughs> we have to end, guys. But before um, I, I have my my questions as well for you, Rob, which is not an easy one. So, Go for it. so we have amazing talent. We have amazing resources. Uh, we have people and projects like yours and mine making super easy uh, for the music to be found. But still, the progress is very slow. Right. So what do you think is the main problem? Why do you think is the main reason for this still happening? Yeah. And to what else can we do uh, to 
speed up and create a real change. Great. Um, yes, I think it's um, one of the issues uh, that I've always found is that change like this um, tends to happen slowly over time because programming tends to only happen at certain parts of the year. And then there's just the implementation of that programming. So it's n unless you're talking about, um, well, I mean, almost any um, uh, musical endeavor, whether or not it's a solo piano through, through a symphony orchestra, it takes time to find new repertoire, to learn that repertoire, to understand that repertoire really, really, really well, and then to feel comfortable with bringing it out into the public. Uh, so just that, that, that takes time, right? It, it could take a year or two for folks to be like, okay, this is important. Here's the repertoire. Now I have to learn it and really get it, you know, inside me and, and uh, uh, under my fingers and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, of course, you know, larger organizations like say orchestras or operas or, or whatever could be making those programming decisions years in advance. And so, you know, the, the, the initiatives that you and I and others have been doing have really, uh, I think been fairly successful in terms of trying to get folks to change what they're doing in the short term but really my focus has always been what can we do to make sure that say three to five years down the road things will really change on a consistent basis on a sustainable basis so year after year after year it's 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 higher it's better we've moved the needle uh and i think a lot of that just has to do with persistence and patience and being willing to not just throw stuff out there like we do on social media, but also to really uh, work directly with the decision makers to get into the large organizations, not just say this orchestra or that choir or that school, but to you know find those organizations that kind of oversee all of those folks and then try to, to uh, change a lot of minds at once rather than yeah. bit by bit yeah. by bit um because obviously leadership changes from organization to organization yeah. and uh it's it, if you're trying to change one person's mindset that's one thing but if you're trying to change the ethos of an entire organization that's it's a challenge but at the same time once you change it then you've changed it yeah and then it's, and then it's there for a while Thanks. so it's it is hard to 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 when you put the information out there to then see what's the 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 what's the lag time in terms of of seeing the change but i think over time especially the my focus has always been less on the really large organizations uh but can you change the minds kind of more of a grassroots within the schools, within the smaller organ, uh, say smaller orchestras that can change, uh, their repertoire more quickly. Um, yeah. and slowly over time, I think that will change. So I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about it, but we have to be patient. Yeah. Way. We, we continue to be patient, but slightly angry at the same time <laughs> in my case. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, Rob, thank you so much once again for taking the time and for everything that you do. And, uh, and I hope people will look into your project more and more and more and uh, realize the amazing uh, tool they have there to help with planning their own small concerts uh, personal concerts and uh please guys well, i'm gonna just put the website here again uh pass it around do i i go there a lot and, and do like lots of uh, hypothetical search searches is a lot of fun to see what i find is amazing <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me and and i should also say thank you for all the work that you've done i mean you've been 
we've been doing this, as you mentioned, we've been kind of doing this uh, as, you know, for, for years. And uh, you've, I think you've really also made uh, a huge impact. And, and uh, I applaud yeah. you for all of the work that you've done as well. For listeners wanting to know more about Donne and everything we do, please check our website on www.donne.uk.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe. And while you're there, it would be great if you could rate and review the show and spread the word on social media. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to be with you in our next interview.